Moon Bay, California. May I have a roll call, please? Council Member Brownstone? Here. Council Member Rarbeck? Here. Council Member Reddick? Here. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Here. Mayor Penrose? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, this evening we are pulling item 3D from the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda minus item 3D, which will be considered at a later council meeting? So moved. What, what are we pulling? Second. Item 3D. D as in Danny Boy. Did I hear a second for that? Sorry. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Brownstone? Yes. Councilmember Rarbeck? Is it Ruddick or Rarbeck? Rarbeck. Yes. Councilmember Ruddick? Yes. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Mayor Penrose? Yes. Motion carries. Proclamations and presentations. Who will be doing that? Make it Main Street announcements, anybody? Well, Make it Main Street is gonna be this Thursday. It's the first Thursday of every month, and it is a venue that goes from three to seven. Am I right in the timing? And yes. includes arts and crafts and music and generally a good time, so please come on down. Mayor's announcements of community activities. Um, there is going to be a movie this Saturday outside the San Benito house. I think it's 7 p.m. Uh, they're showing Pretty Girl or Pretty Woman. I'm not sure. Pretty Woman. Um, so that should be fun outside watching a movie. Uh, we do have the Make It Main Street. Um, the Wine and Jazz Festival is coming up. I can't remember the date for that. Um, the 13th, of, 13th and 14th. And then we have the Dream Machines, which is coming up on... Anybody know that date? I had it on my computer, and I didn't bring my computer with me, so I apologize, but it's, it's a couple weeks from now. Uh, I think we have another council meeting before it, it happens. Yeah, so I'll announce it again. April 30th. April 30th, okay. Um, report out from recent closed sessions. Um, our attorney, Catherine Enberg. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, there was nothing to report out of closed session. The council did meet in closed session prior to this meeting to discuss two items, one item of anticipated litigation or threat of litigation, and a second item regarding uh, performance evaluation of city attorney, and nothing to report out. Thank you. Thank you. And we have our city manager who is visiting us via hybrid Zoom. We have Veronica Vostanek who will be presenting the city ah, manager. Ah, so Veronica tonight. is doing it tonight. Yes. Great. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, no problem. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I'm just here to, okay. How's this? Is this better? Okay. Uh, I'm Veronica Vostanek, the Public Works and Sustainability Programs Manager, and I'm here to just give a couple updates about some events that are coming up in the next couple weeks. Um, so first is our Earth Day um, Community Recycling Day. This is happening next, next Saturday, April 15th, at Smithfield from 9 a.m. to uh, 12 p.m. noon. Uh, this is always a really popular event. We uh, have free compost giveaway, e-waste recycling, and document shredding available for any Half Moon Bay residents. Um, it's sponsored by Republic Services. We're really appreciative for um, the two events that we hold every year, one in the spring and one in the fall. Um, so we hope to see you there. And uh, we are 
draft climate action plan uh, was published on the city's website uh, December of 2022. And uh, we have a couple outreach events. We've been doing outreach in um, February through um, April. And we have next Saturday at the farmer's market, I'll be there tabling, um, and I'll also be there with Okapi Reusables, which is doing a pilot at the Half and Bay Coffee Company. So if you wanna learn about the Climate Action Plan or that, pi that pilot, you come visit us just outside here um, on Saturday from nine to one. Uh, next Friday on April 14th, Senior Coastiders is holding an Earth Day event. Um, so I'll be there along with Peninsula Clean Energy, the county, and a couple other um, tables, and we'll be celebrating Earth Day. So that's from 1.30 to 3.30 at the Senior Center um, at 925 Main Street. And on April 23rd, we will also be uh, talking about the Climate Action Plan at the State Park's Wildflower Day. So that's at Francis Beach from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, the draft is available on our website, and the comment deadline is May 12th. So unless there's any questions, that's it for me and the city manager updates. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah. Any questions for Veronica? When is the e-waste day? The e-waste day is this coming Saturday. No, next Saturday, the 15th. Next Saturday, I apologize. What's yeah. the location? Smithfield. Smithfield. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank cool. you, Veronica. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And now we're going to public forum, and we have two speakers. The first speaker is Paul Gregoriev. Uh, oh, that sounds good. Good evening, council members. It's nice to be back after three years in a live session of the city council. We love it. Uh, I just had a couple of items that I wanted to kind of underline uh, that could use the council's attention. Uh, one is uh, the condition of Route 92, uh, its dangerous uh, problems of falling trees, huge potholes, and the need to dodge back and forth in order to make progress. It's really dangerous now, and it seems to me that we need to do something positive to, c to control the growth of these trees that are too close to the road and don't have good root systems, to get the road repaired, and importantly, to let people know somehow, perhaps through SMC Alert, in a way that reaches the entire community what the condition of 92 is uh, each day. On uh, next door, I see constant questions from the public is it open? Is it one way? Can I get to my doctor's appointment? It seems to me that some public agency, nominally SMC Alert, which is the best known, should start some service that does that. So if you look into that, I think it would be a great idea. Uh, the other problem uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention is the miserable condition of our infrastructure with regard to data. Uh, specifically Comcast is uh, just running berserk in terms of failures, problems, and an in a, a seeming inability to deal with them in under six to 12 hours. And if we're serious about economic development on the coast side, we need to somehow be serious about making access to the internet consistently and, uh, how shall we say, uh, openly available to the public. Uh, it's a real problem. And in the days when we had, um, what, we had uh, uh, legal, um, what, are, what am I trying to, the word I'm, I'm searching for is uh, we, we granted permission to the carriers to use our lines. Now we don't do that, and yet we have no control over them and big problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Next, we have Chely Con Collins. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You came very close. It's Chely Collins. Thank you. Oh, good evening, council members. Um, I moved to Half Moon Bay about a year and a half ago, September 2021. But prior to that, I had been coming over to the coast for about 20 years because I board my horses over here. So several times a week, I would be here. 
and I'm very glad I made the move. So that's all been wonderful. But once I moved here, I wanted to become engaged with the community and contribute um, and make myself a useful member here. And I volunteer with the Senior Center for Meals on Wheels. I'm a literacy tutor for the library. Um, and so I've started engaging and meeting people and just becoming a productive member. Um, I heard about the opening on the Planning Commission. And so while I don't know that I was particularly qualified to be on the Planning Commission, I submitted a, an application and heard back from uh, Mr. Rarock saying, thank you for your application. We've chosen someone, you know, great. That's fine. I'm not, you know, that didn't hurt my feelings. I will tell you that. But I went back and said, so how do you determine the candidates, you know, how do you qualify the candidates and decide who's on the commission? And I didn't hear anything back. So I then sent an additional email to Ms. Mayor, the city manager, um, Mr. Arbach, and Ms. Jimenez, who I, or Mr. Jimenez, who I think, I'm over on the Arleta Park area, who I think represents our area, it's unclear, asking, you know, how do we choose members for the commissions? What criteria do you use? What are you looking for in the candidates? The same thing that I would do if I was hiring an individual. Do you interview them? I also looked on the website, you know, extensively saying where, you know, maybe this information is here. And I was unable to find it. So my request to the city council is that how we choose people for a commission, any commission, parks and recreation, planning commission, whatever, should have a spelled out policy that said we're looking for this, this is how we do it, this is how we screen people, this is the interview process that we set up, and it should be published on the website. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Yes. I will, thank you. Um, first Zoom speaker is Shauna Pickett-Gordon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm from Coastside Faith in Action, and I'm here in solidarity with ALAS and our other grassroots organizations supporting local government's efforts to stem the humanitarian crisis of housing on the coast side. We applaud this council's approach, multiple approaches to the local housing crisis. You've done great work for our homeless with Coast House, for those living in vehicles with the beginning of a safe parking program and for those inadequately housed with plans and funds for affordable and extremely low income housing. And I really thank you for your commitment to move fair housing to the top of your priority list. Here's what's worrying me at the moment. The need is far greater than most of us coastsiders realize. For the past 40 years, we've heard about the housing needs of essential workers including our thousands of agricultural workers, but it took a national spotlight, spotlight on the tragic massacre of January 23rd to open many of the community's eyes to the conditions under which nobody would want to live, much less raise their families, but have been living for generations. It took that shock to light a fire under most coastsiders' consciences. So besides asking you to keep pushing on fair housing solutions, I'd really like us to get the message out to the public more strongly, such as why the focus on fair housing? What's the impact if we don't put all possible effort behind that project? What are our current actions and their statuses? What county and state initiatives can we join or support for fair housing? And in what kind of timeline can we make a significant enough dent in the crisis? Getting that message out, I know, may raise opposition and controversy. Uh, next door will be full of it. But I don't think we can avoid engaging with taxpayers who haven't yet seen the need. So many securely housed coastsiders don't realize how many of their neighbors live a completely opposite reality, even when their houses are cleaned, their children are tended, and their groceries are made possible by people who have, for generations, lived here on the razor's edge. And I'd like to suggest that the real life stories of those who are most affected by the housing crisis can be powerful in helping sharpen a community's conscience. If home is sacred, then it's gotta be sacred to everybody regardless of income or privilege. 
a very well-prepared community forum was done around Coast House a couple of years ago, and I think it might be a good investment in this, um, in this work also. So in closing, just two big asks. <laughs> One, please, please keep fair housing at the top of your list. This is the Coast Sites humanitarian crisis, and we're big enough to solve it. Two, please consider a way of messaging the taxpayer base, possibly through articles in the Huffington Bay Review, with the stories of those most affected by our dire housing crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, next, we have Crystalline. Thank you so much, Crystalline from the Coastside Chamber. I'm sorry I couldn't be there tonight. I just wanted to let the community and the council know that today we launched a survey asking both businesses and residents to let us know what their storm damage was uh, for the past couple of months. Um, we're working to help um, a couple of different agencies gather uh, more comprehensive data um, about what types of in, uh, damage was sustained, what the ultimate cost ended up being, and whether or not uh, insurances covered or didn't cover. Um, and then we'll be able to use that data from here on out in things like mitigation plans and so forth. So thank you very much. And if you want to fill out the survey, if you live anywhere on the coast side, it's uh, on the homepage of coastside365.com. Thank you. Thank you, Crystalline. Uh, Suzanne Moore. Good evening, council and staff. My name is Suzanne Moore, a Pacifica resident, a member of Coastside Faith in Action and a retired family nurse practitioner from our county. I recently had the honor to meet with the Alice Affordable Housing Committee and hear their stories of years of struggle to access safe, affordable housing. As a former healthcare provider, I have long appreciated that housing is necessary for life and health, for the individual, the family, and the community as a whole. I appreciate the work that Half Moon Bay has done to assure farm worker housing after this community's tragedy, and I'm excited and support the Kelly Street Project for senior farm worker housing. I also appreciate the city's recognition to limit conversion of housing stock to short term rentals and to provide some housing stability with the residential rental security measures ordinance of 2019. I believe that solutions to our housing crisis can come from those most impacted. And I encourage the city to work closely with all us. Communities are interdependent and community health requires that we work together. There's a scarcity of low income housing on the coast. While we take the time to build that much needed low income housing, we can urgently act to follow guidelines from the Association of Bay Area Governments, protect from displacement and homelessness and preserve existing low income housing. Please work with Alice to forge that path forward. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Brad Steinweed. Council and council members, this is Brad Steinweed from Miramar. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I am speaking today uh, primarily because of something that is on the agenda, but um, I'm looking for uh, some guidance from the city as to what's going on more generally. Um, this is item 1D, the acceptance of the Miramar Sea Point Rise Vulnerability um, issue that uh, you'll be talking about in a short while. Um, this brought to my attention that the city is looking at one mile of coastline uh, at the very southern end of the city. And I'm hoping that the city is looking at the coastal vulnerability um, for the remainder of the coastline. Um, because I'm noticing that uh, just south of Sam's Charter House, that the coastal walk is in danger there, that um, by the Miramar 
um, restaurant. Uh, the road is in danger there. And the berms that um, separate the ocean from housing um, further south and in that area are eroding. And there is one area nearby what were the rangers' cottages um, where the berm has all but disappeared. And a exceptional high tide uh, could see coastal housing actually flooded. So my question or hope is that the city is uh, interested and in looking at the coastal vulnerability for the entire of Half Moon Bay, not just Miramontes. And um, I look forward to that, seeing that on an agenda in the future. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Rocio Avila. Buenas tardes, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, primero que nada, quiero darle las gracias a todo el concilio. So first of all, I'd like to thank the entire council. Por haber acompañado a los trabajadores y por haber hablado ante la Comisión Costera de California. So for having accompanied all of the farm workers and attending the Coastal Commission meeting. Sobre la gran necesidad de vivienda aquí en Half Moon Bay. In regard to the high need of uh, housing here in Half Moon Bay. Por habernos acompañado también en la junta que se hizo en la biblioteca also el, día, for, siete, el día 27. Also for accompanying us on another meeting that was held in the library on the 27th. Y por estar presentes y apoyándonos en la gran necesidad de vivienda asequible. And for just being present and helping us out with this great need of housing, affordable housing. Sabemos que es una gran necesidad, pero sabemos que si trabajamos todos juntos, esto va a ser posible. We know this is a huge need, but if we all work together, this can be possible. De que se pueda construir y brindarnos un hogar a todas esas familias que necesitamos. To construct the housing and give all of the families in need a house. También les pido que busquen opciones. I'm also busquen, asking for you guys to look at some options. Busquen personas que nos puedan ayudar, personas que quieran invertir. Find people that can help us, maybe people that might want to invest. Personas que estén ahí para nosotros, también apoyándonos. People that are going to be there for us, supporting us. Para la realización de estas viviendas. To uh, have these uh, housing, have this housing. Y otra cosa que tengo también para, para preguntar. Oh, and one more thing I need to ask. El otra vez en la, en la junta pregunté sobre la limpieza de la calle Miramontes Point Road. So last time I was asking about the cleaning or the cleanup over on Miramontes Road. Sobre toda la tierra que está sobre la, la calle, a quién tenían que avisarle al condado o a la ciudad in sobre regards la to all the dirt and stuff and debris that was on the road who did I need to contact the city or the county es un peligro cuando está mojado para las personas que caminan sobre la banqueta so it's a danger for people walking by when it's wet on the sidewalk si la ciudad tiene algo que ver sobre una parte de esta calle, pedimos por favor que se haga una limpieza. So if the city has anything to do uh, with this part, uh, we ask the city to please do a clean up or clean it up. Para poder evitar algún accidente a futuro. So that way we can avoid an accident in the future. Es todo, muchas gracias. That's all, thank you very much. Gracias, Rocio. Uh, Gloria Stofan. 
Good evening, city council members and city staff. Can you hear me over there? Yes, thank you. Oh, good. Um, my name's Gloria Stofan, and I live in Pacifica. I'm also a member of Faith in Action Coastside. I'll be brief, uh, but I did want to thank you for giving me this chance to speak to you and also to thank you for your sensitivity on these housing issues. They're not easy and very complicated, especially in making big decisions. Um, we're all very much aware that the Bay Area is very much suffering a high housing crisis and in particularly here on the coast. And at the same time, I look at the ocean and our beautiful hills and open space and I think to myself, where else can we build more housing? affordable housing, low-income housing, and yet at the same time, many of our neighbors are struggling to pay rent or are losing their jobs, and some may even the possibility of experiencing food insecurity. I'm very much concerned for the need for low-income housing here on the coast, here in Half Moon Bay. The need needs to be prioritized by the city. Also, this word affordability is a very misleading word, and in particularly here in the Bay Area. What does it actually mean to be affordable? I would like for Half Moon Bay to prioritize and take into consideration those that are the most vulnerable, the most needy. A stable home is a healthy community. Thank you. No further speakers, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, we are moving on to the consent calendar. Does anyone wish on council wish to pull anything from the consent calendar? Seeing none, um, may I have a motion, please? Uh, I move that we adopt the consent calendar uh, following items, items 1A, waive reading of resolutions and ordinances, item 1B, uh, warrants for the month of February 2023, item 1C, professional services agreement for on-call geomorphology services, item 1D, acceptance of the Miramontes Point sea level rise vulnerability and fiscal impact assessment. Item 1E, resolution designating the city manager, public works director, and administrative services director by title as applicants agenda for non-state agencies for the California Office of Emergency Services Public Assistance Program and Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Item 1F, accepting dedication of a three-foot public utility and pedestrian access easement at 419 Garcia Avenue. And that's it. And I have a second. Second. Um, all in favor? Can I do an all in favor? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion passes. We're moving on to um, resolutions and staff reports. We have no um, ordinances or public hearings this evening. Um, item 3A, the adoption of the 2023 legislative platform. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item is to consider adoption of the 2023 legislative platform and to also receive a legislative update. Andres Ramirez, our consultant through Townsend Public Affairs, is here to go over that with you and uh, provide an update on some key priority bills. Um, as a reminder, the City Council adopts a legislative platform each spring that is then used to guide and, per, guide and inform our advocacy efforts throughout the legislative session. Um, staff and Townsend work closely together to monitor bills of importance to the city and advocate our positions as necessary. Um, the legislative subcommittee made up of Councilmember Reddick and Mayor Penrose also meet throughout the year and met earlier uh, in March to establish the legislative platform for this year. And then throughout this session, the city will send position letters as necessary on bills that the subcommittee um, has taken a position on based on the adopted platform. In rare occurrences, if there is a bill of 
high controversy or high uh, profile bill that the subcommittee prefers to get the full council's opinion on, we will bring that for a discussion item prior to taking any position. So with that, um, Andres and I will be available to answer any questions and I'll turn it over to him to go over this year's platform. Thank you, Jessica, and good afternoon, honorable mayor and council members. Andres Ramirez with Townsend Public Affairs. Um, as Jessica mentioned, you know, we prepared this draft legislative platform for your review and ultimate approval tonight um, for the 2023-2024 legislative session. Purpose of the legislative platform being uh, so we can act swiftly on pieces of legislation that are, you know, introduced or working its way through the committee process um, and the policy process as a whole at the state and federal level. As many of you know, uh, legislative bills come very frequently. They're amended frequently. So having this legislative platform adopted is really critical to ensure that we can act in a timely manner and actually have our voices heard. With that, um, I wanted to just mention a couple things before diving right in. As I said, this is the beginning of a two-year legislative session. In the state legislature, there's 25% new members. Um, so that's a very significant shift. Part of it's due to term limits, part of it's due to redistricting and folks not wanting to run. Part of it has to do with folks running for higher office, uh, retirement, et cetera. Uh, but with that, one might traditionally expect some you know, changes or shifts in, in overall policy priorities. However, the priorities of the state legislature have remained largely the same, though the priorities at the federal level in Congress have certainly changed um, due to Republicans taking over the House. Um, but with that, in general, uh, key topics that are going to be focused on are climate resiliency, affordable housing continues to be a huge issue for the legislature, homelessness, behavioral health, and then fiscal sustainability. Excuse me, Andres. Oh, the other one. How's this? It works? All right. Green light? Okay. Good to go. Thank Excellent. You. Excellent. So with those kind of similar priorities um, in the legislature this year, uh, we have utilized that to frame the City of Half Moon Bay's legislative priorities. And then after we had that draft, as Jessica mentioned, uh, we went to the legislative subcommittee in March for some additional feedback. So I will walk through these at a high level and just mention a couple of edits and additions that we've had since last year's iteration, uh, though many of the focus areas stay the same. So I'll go through the focus areas. We have climate resiliency, housing, and affordable housing. And one of the new items we added in this specific focus area is advocating for funding for the production of affordable housing, including farm worker housing. Obviously, we know that's a very big issue here in the city of Half Moon Bay. We have homelessness as a priority area, and under that priority area, we added a point to say we support legislative efforts that seek to ensure the compassionate treatment of homeless individuals. Then we have an economic development focus area, an infrastructure focus area, and in this, this is a little more budget related, so advocating for programs and funds that will help bolster the development of key water infrastructure advocating for increased funding for transportation and active transportation projects like trails, biking pathways, pedestrian projects, opposing budget cuts to transportation and active transportation funding streams, 
and monitoring legislation closely and regulations related to wind energy, which is something that continues to be pursued uh, at the state and federal legislative levels. And we also have a focus area on elections. So, um, and, and Assembly Member Berman, who uh, of course is the City of Half Moon Bay's Assembly Member, has a lot of experience in that policy area. He used to chair the Elections Committee in the Assembly. Um, we have a public safety focus area, government transparency focus area, and one of the new things that we included there is working on and supporting legislation that promotes accessibility to public proceedings and meetings. And then a health equity area, and this is one of our newer ones and we have three new additions to that, which include supporting legislation and funding to grow the behavioral health workforce, advocating for funding for mental health treatment facilities, and exploring and considering working on legislative efforts to create healthcare services districts as necessary. Once again, as Jessica mentioned, um, we do plan on meeting with the City Council's legislative subcommittee on a more regular basis in order to discuss any sort of pieces of legislation and bills that fall within these focus areas should you all decide to adopt them. Um, and then we can take swift action in deciding, all right, these are the bills we need to focus on. These are the bills that maybe warrant a support letter or maybe an opposition letter in some instances or oppose unless amended or support if amended or maybe just a watch track and see how it plays out. Uh, so a lot of options there. Um, and with that, that, is, that concludes my overview of the legislative framework, though I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you may have um, before you make a decision on adoption. Thank you. Um, do we have any public that wishes to speak on this item? I have no speakers, Mayor. Okay, oh. I'll bring it back to Council then. Council, hold on, I do have, I do have one. Okay, we have one speaker. Buenas noches a todos. Good evening, everyone. Gracias por su tiempo. Thank you for your time. Acabo de escuchar la, las propuestas que el señor acaba de mencionar. I, I just listened to all the proposals that this gentleman uh, mentioned. Una pequeña uh, pregunta. So I just have a tiny question. Cuando dijo que hará viviendas accesibles, o uno de los planes es hacer viviendas accesibles, solo para agricultores? So when you mention about affordable housing, is that just simply for farm workers? Porque no sé si pudieron asistir a la junta, ahí pude ver a, ver a la mayor, que ella sí asistió a la junta de la 55 Kelly. I don't, I don't know if you guys had uh, went to the meeting. I know that the, I saw the mayor there at uh, 555 Kelly donde se pudo demostrar de que hay mucha necesidad de viviendas, no solo de personas que trabajan en agricultura, de los trabajadores esenciales también. Where it was demonstrated that housing is not just for farm workers, but for other people as well, essential workers as well. Como usted pudo ver en esa junta, hay mucha necesidad en el pueblo. Y no lo digo solo por los agricultores, los agricultores sufren mucho. Pero también nosotros, las personas que somos trabajadores esenciales, nos vemos muy difícil en este pueblo por la vivienda. So as you were able to see, there's a, uh, it was demonstrated that there's a huge need for housing, but not just farm worker housing, because there's, you know, because the farm workers really do suffer, but for other essential workers as well. Y como ya se los he dicho en otras ocasiones, nuestro Interés en las viviendas no es una vivienda gratis, es una vivienda que podamos pagar y contribuir a la comunidad. So as I mentioned it before, we're not asking for free housing, but more of just some housing where we're able to contribute uh, to, the, to the whole. Yo sé que a muchos legisladores les puede parecer algo trillado o aburrido o que ya estamos ocasionando muchos problemas con este tema, pero es algo muy importante porque nosotros también contribuimos a la comunidad. 
I know that some legislators might think we're beating a dead horse or it might seem like boring conversation, but we do have to say that we do contribute a lot to, to contribute a lot to the community. Nosotros somos la mano de obra de este pueblo. Sería lamentable que nos tengamos que mover de aquí. Y yo lo digo personalmente, si yo no encuentro una renta justa para mí, yo tendré que mudarme de aquí y junto con nosotros irán nuestros hijos también. ¿Qué quedará entonces en, esta, en este pueblo? ¿Solo personas que sí tengan un empleo que sí pueda pagar renta? So, if, if this doesn't come to pass, you know, they'll, we'll just have to move away and that's the situation with me. If I can't find a place to live, I'll be able to move out. And along with us moving out, others will move out and their children as well will also move out. Nosotros pudimos asistir también a la junta que se hizo en la costa, donde la comisión dijo que sí, es importante hacer vivienda para nosotros. We also went to the meeting uh, for the Coastal Commission, where the Coastal Commission in fact said that yes, housing is very important. Mi pregunta ahora es, ¿es importante para ustedes nuestro trabajo, que nosotros estemos aquí en este pueblo, que estemos brindando la economía a este pueblo, generando economía? So my question is, is it important to you all, you know, our work, our line of work, the jobs we do so that we can contribute here on the coast? Si es importante, por favor, demuéstrenos que somos importantes para ustedes y incluyanos también. Nosotros no queremos algo gratis, queremos algo que podamos pagar y seguir aportando a este país. Show us, show us that we're important and that our line of work is important. We don't want free housing, we just want something where we can contribute to the whole. Así que por favor, cuando hablemos de viviendas, viviendas justas para todos, agricultores y trabajadores esenciales. En los trabajadores esenciales también se pueden incluir los maestros. Como saben, ellos también educan a, a nuestros hijos y muchos de ellos no tienen emple su empleo y su salario justo. So when we talk about housing, affordable housing, not just farm workers, but all essential workers. And I also throw in teachers there as well, so that way they can ha be able to pay with what the salary they make. Si somos un, una, un país de unión, seamos justos para todos, vivienda justa para todos, algo que podamos pagar, pagar todos y que nos podamos sentir bien en este pueblo. Muchas gracias. So if we're unified, I think that just fair housing is for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's any other speakers, Jessica? Uh, no other speakers, ma'am. Okay, I bring it back to count. Uh, Andres, thank you very much for dealing with uh, the legislative update. And I'm heartily in favor of this additional emphasis on affordable housing. I mean, you, you hear it all the time. and. Uh, we need to support any legislation that can actually build and uh, enable more affordable housing. So thank you. And council member, if I may, um, just to clarify for, for the full council, um, just because we specifically pointed out um, the farm worker housing does not at all preclude the council within the scope of this legislative framework uh, from supporting actively any sort of legislative efforts to bolster affordable housing as a whole for everyone, including just you know essential workers, the general public, teachers, what have you. And in fact, in here, so I was just pointing out one new addition, but in here we have uh, a line which talks about supporting legislation uh, that advances the creation and funding of affordable housing. Um, and it doesn't give any specific to you know the line of work or, or the industry that individuals work in. So just to address that, um, yeah, this is kind of just all encompassing. The only reason I mentioned the farm worker housing was because it was something that was flagged for our attention, uh, but it does not preclude the council from advocating in support of affordable housing for everybody. So just, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else from council? Just to remind me, was there specific support of any legislation um, reinforcing the need for reliable internet services in remote areas like here. Yeah, thank you, council member. So 
in last year's legislative session and the bulk of the digital divide bridging and, and internet connectivity legislation was passed in 2021. So the first year of last legislative session, which was 21-22. There were a number of state policy bills as well as federal bills um, that passed through that had associated budget appropriations, um, which effectively allocated you know, billions of dollars going through to the California Public Utilities Commission to then open up competitive grant programs, um, oftentimes for internet service providers, but sometimes for local agencies and jurisdictions, such as cities, counties, um, or consortiums that involve cities, counties, and private entities, um, to then apply for funding to help bolster um, internet connectivity in areas where you know, connectivity is not as great or internet service uh, is not as prevalent. So yes, that was a big, big push last legislative session. There continues to be discussions around it and how to increase the effectiveness of existing appropriations. Uh, however, due to the state's significant anticipated budget deficit, which right now is around $23.5 billion deficit, um, we're likely not going to see additional appropriations, but again, there's a lot of money that was allocated in a previous session that the CPUC and other regulatory bodies and agencies at the state level have yet to open up grant programs for. So they're formulating the programs, formulating the process, going through the formal rulemaking process, um, and, and likely in the next year or so, there's gonna be a multitude of programs opening up, uh, which you know, local entities may be eligible to apply for to help bolster out internet connectivity. Okay, well, keep us on your mind. Keep us on our state legislature's mind, minds because, um, you know, between San Francisco and um, Santa Cruz, you know, there's a few small towns here. We're pretty isolated, as current conditions have shown. So when there's uh, flooding um, like we've had, a lot of systems went down, and then people, that isolation is visceral and um, it is a matter of money of creating some more redundancies for us in terms of service so that'd be great thanks okay no more discussion from council may i have a motion please I move that we adopt a resolution establishing a legislative platform for 2023. Second. Roll call. Councilmember Brownstone? Yes. Councilmember Rarbeck? Yes. Councilmember Reddick? Yes. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Mayor Penrose? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We're moving on to a work session on the operation of e bikes and other electric devices on trails and paths. There we go. Good evening, council, members of the public. My name is Matt Nichols, and tonight, as part of the work session, I'll be presenting on the operation of e-bikes and other electric devices. Oh, sorry. How's that? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Sorry. So as part of tonight's uh, work session, I'll be giving a presentation on the operation of e-bikes and other electric devices on paths and trails. Before I get into that presentation, a couple quick things. Um, Going over what or how the state classifies e-bikes, uh, th that classification is broken into three categories, class one, two, and three. For class one e-bikes, those are e-bikes that are pedal assist only, so the electric motor on those bikes will only uh, provide additional input if you're pedaling the bicycle. 
those class one e-bikes have a top speed with the pedal assist of 20 miles an hour. So you could ride that bike faster than 20 miles an hour, but the motor would not give you any more assistance once you've hit that 20 mile an hour threshold. For the class two e-bikes, they're pretty similar to the class one where they have the pedal assist uh, giving you that, that boost, but they also have a throttle. So you don't need to be pedaling the class two e-bike in order to get it to provide input to the system. Um, that being said, similar to the way the, the pedal assist works, once you hit that 20 mile an hour threshold, the motor will stop providing additional input. So if you wanted to ride a class two faster, you need to do so under your own power. For the class three, there is no throttle on those. It's just pedal assist. Uh, it's okay. It's just pedal assist. Um, so there's no throttle on that, and the top speed for the class three is, is bumped up to 28 miles an hour. And then for the uh, discussion tonight, we're just gonna be talking about the paved multi-use class one bikeway. So we're not talking about dirt trails, decomposed gravel. It's, it's basically just like the paths in, in the picture above. Um, that's a nice section of the coastal trail. Before I get into the, the presentation, I just want to give a quick overview of the staff recommendation. Um, briefly, staff is just recommending um, the establishment of a 15 miles an hour speed limit with five miles an hour when passing, permitting class one, two, and three e-bikes along with e-boards and scooters, and then creating and placing share the trail signage along Half Moon Bay's multi-use trails. For an outline of this presentation, I'll go into some background about some of the laws that brought us to where we are this evening, a recap of the May 17th uh, City Council meeting where this topic was last discussed, and then I'll go into a summary of the adjacent jurisdictions and the public survey that we put out last year. And then finally, I'll go into the recommendations from the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisor Committee and staff. In 1983, the city uh, passed its ordinance 10.48, and what that essentially did was ban the use of motorized vehicles on Half Moon Bay's trails. That ordinance is still in effect, um, and that's what bans things like electric bicycles, electric skateboards, dune buggies, um, but also electric, or sorry, I think I misspoke there. It bans gasoline-powered uh, bicycles, skateboards, things like that, as well as electric, um, to some extent. I'll get more into that in a little bit. In 1999, um, the state passed a law uh, that changed the California Vehicle Code uh, surrounding motorized scooters, including electric scooters. And part of that um, was establishing a 15 miles per hour speed limit uh, for those devices when they're on trails. So that's part of the California Vehicle Code. In 2016, two things happened that really changed the game and brought us to where we are this evening. One of those is the state took electric bicycles and reclassified them from motorized vehicles to a subcategory of bicycles. And the way that was written, those class one and two electric bicycles are permitted by default, and class three is prohibited by default. So if you don't have any ordinance uh, surrounding those devices, class one and two would be permitted and class three would be prohibited. Um, and then also in 2016, the state passed some legislation that changed the California Vehicle Code surrounding electric skateboards. Um, and similar to the e-scooters, with that change, there was a 15 mile an hour speed limit for those devices when they're also on trails. At the May 17th City Council meeting, um, Council asked staff research what other jurisdictions e-bike policies are, um, as well as review the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District's e-bike pilot project that had just, uh, I believe, just concluded at the time of that meeting, as well as hold a public survey on e-bikes and go back to BPAC to get a solidified recommendation on the Class 3 e-bikes as well as e-boards and e-scooters. Uh, near the end of that May 17th City Council meeting, City Council asked that staff bring up these uh, points the next time this topic was brought to Council, so I'll do that right now. Many agencies are allowing e-bikes because they don't want to miss out on the grant opportunities tied to them. Uh, prohibiting e-bikes may cause some issues with the Coastal Commission. The technology is getting cheaper and more attainable. We're starting to see these e-bikes in, in big box stores. Um, they're, they're becoming lighter, smaller. We're starting to see them a lot more often. When it comes to enforcement on trails, not just for e-bikes, but really for all kinds of policies, um, jurisdictions of all sizes have, have the same issues that we do. 
It doesn't matter if you're East Bay Regional Parks or if you're Half Moon Bay. It can be very difficult to enforce all kinds of ordinances when you're out in a trail system. Um, and right now at this time, the coastal trail is the only safe way to commute up and down the coastside on bike. Um, and even when the uh, proposed and planned uh, new sections of the trail are completed, some people may wish to continue to do so because it is such a beautiful view. This is a map uh, showing the local jurisdictions that have those paved class one multi-use trails. Um, so the reason the Harbor District and CLT aren't on this map, even though we're talking to them, is because they don't have those paved multi-use trails. Um, to the north there, we have San Mateo County Parks. Following the coast and heading south, we'll have state parks. And then in the dark blue, that's the city of Half Moon Bay's current trail network. Looking east a little bit and starting at the north again, we have more of San Mateo County Parks, and that's where we start to see the light blue dashed line. And those light blue dashed lines represent the new sections of trail that aren't currently existing but hope to be coming online soon. A quick summary of, of those adjacent jurisdictions um, and their policies. This is for speed limits. State Parks has a speed limit of 15 miles an hour and 5 mile an hour when passing. Something to note is that when you're in the Half Moon Bay campground area, that speed limit drops down to 10 miles an hour. San Mateo County Parks has a 15 mile an hour speed limit with five miles an hour at their trailheads. And the Harbor District and CLT don't have a speed limit at this time. Um, as, as part of that uh, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District pilot project that we looked into, we found that they also have a speed limit of 15 miles an hour with five mile an hour passing. Um, and I felt that it would be good to include that even though they're not on this map and they don't currently have any properties in city limits just to kind of keep in, in mind what, what they're doing as well because their work was really helpful in this project. When it comes to those uh, jurisdictions and the devices that they allow, state parks only allows class one e-bikes. Um, I believe prior to the last city council meeting on the topic, they allowed class one and class two, but since then from the state level, that's changed to only allowing class one. We are currently reaching out to state parks at, at district and state level to, to try and see if we can collaborate with them. They have um, some policies where it seems that we might be able to have them adopt whatever kind of ordinance that we decide to go with. Um, and we, we'd hope to be able to do something like that to have a more unified set of rules along the coastal trail. Um, for the Harbor District, oh sorry, for San Mateo County Parks, they allow class one, two, and three e-bikes, as well as e-boards and e-scooters, so kind of the opposite end of state parks there. Um, and then the San Mateo County Harbor District has no ordinance at this time, and Coastside Land Trust allows those devices for ADA purposes only. Looking at Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District again, um, they allow class one and class two e-bikes only in two of their preserves, Rancho San Antonio and Ravenswood. Um, something worth noting about that, though, is those are their only two preserves that have paved, uh, those paved class one multi-use kind of bike paths, similar to what we have on the coastal trail. Uh, when comparing Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space to the city of Half Moon Bay, it's good to keep in mind it's not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison. They, their trail network is a lot more rugged, single-track, double-track terrain. Um, so it kind of makes sense the two places that they allowed these e-bikes were the two places that had similar topography and trail systems to what we have. Jumping into the public survey that was done last summer, um, the city of Half Moon Bay put out a, a survey last summer from August to mid-September, and this survey was advertised uh, along the, the Half Moon Bay's trail networks. So we put out six signs um, along all of our trails to try and get trail users to participate in this survey. Um, as well as advertising the survey online through social media and our website. We had a really great turnout. We had 241 responses. If you take that amount of responses by the uh, three-minute average for public comment, that comes out to almost 12 hours of public comment. So that's a wealth of, of input and knowledge on this topic. Some of the first questions we asked was just kind of get an idea of, of the residents and the people taking the survey. Uh, of the survey takers, 63% said they lived in the city of Half Moon Bay. Um, and then as a separate question, 29% of survey takers said that they worked in the city of Half Moon Bay. Um, we don't know how many of the 63% to make up the 29%, so you could have people commuting in from over the hill, um, but there is sure to be some overlap there. 
this is kind of a snapshot of a bunch of questions from the survey. Um, what this chart basically represents is if you were to go to the uh, trails in Half Moon Bay for a month and look at the varying ways people commute on our trails, you should see roughly this breakdown. Um, some things to point out is that no one user group um, has a majority when it comes to uh, modes of trail usage. However, walkers make up the largest group at 43%. The next two largest groups would be bikes and e-bikes. And if you were to combine those two groups together, that would be about 44%, so a little bit more than walkers. Um, going on to the next questions from the public survey. Uh, in essence, with this question, what we asked was, did survey takers believe that the city should um, have any kind of uh, prohibitions regarding electric motorized vehicles on Half Moon Bay's trails. 65%, almost a super majority of survey takers said that they do not believe the city should have any um, limits on those electric vehicles on Half Moon Bay's trails and instead focus on speed. The next largest group for that would be 33% uh, of survey takers saying that they would like to see some kinds of uh, prohibitions of electric vehicles on the coastal trail. Another of the survey questions was going to that speed. 76% um, of survey takers said that they feel speed um, is, they would like to see, sorry, they would like to see a speed limit on the coastal trail, um, even if it could only be enforced periodically. And 74% of survey takers said that they felt speed represents a safety factor on the trails mentioned. Lastly, we asked survey takers, if we were to do a speed limit, what speed limit do they think we should have? Um, it's pretty across the board, but the largest group is 15 miles an hour, and that's pretty standard. We saw a, a lot of jurisdictions uh, have that 15 mile an hour speed limit for their um, bike trails. So what we did after we did that survey and we got that information um, from other jurisdictions, we went back to BPAC to get a recommendation and their recommendation was to implement a speed limit of 15 miles an hour on all trails, allow class one, two, and three e-bikes on all trails, allow e-boards and e-scooters e on all trails, and place air the trail signage along all trails. Um, and we've been working with BPAC to create that signage, and this is a draft of what we came up with. Uh, I have a larger version of that and some mock-ups of what that looks like if, if it's hard to see. This is a mock-up of what that might look like on the coastal trail. And then finally, uh, the staff recommendation. And staff is recommending uh, that council conducts a workshop and by motion directs staff to draft an ordinance amending the Half Moon Bay Municipal Code to establish a speed limit of 15 miles per hour with five miles an hour when passing on all Half Moon Bay trails, permit class one, two, and three e-bikes as well as electric scooters and electric boards on all Half Moon Bay owned multi-use paths and trails, and create in place, share the trail signage along Half Moon Bay's multi-use paths and trails. Any questions? Do I pick who goes there? Yeah. So um, what sort of uh, recommendation did you get from the Parks and Rec Commission? Because at the very last meeting we considered this, one of our directions was to take it to the Parks and Rec Commission. I am not aware at this time of any um, recommendation from the Parks and Rec Commission, but I can definitely reach out to them um, and bring that up and get back to you. I have a question. Is there any way to, is there any way to identify class A, uh, class uh, one, two, or three? How can we identify them? Yeah, so part of that state law was that those devices uh, are supposed to have a sticker on them saying if they're class one, two, or three. But unless you're right on that bicycle, it's incredibly hard to tell. Um, I have a couple slides showing the varying bikes. Um, this might take a moment. So this slide shows the class one, two, and three e-bikes. Um, and from looking at this, it's, it's pretty difficult to tell <laughs> just by looking at it what the difference is. And then to make it slightly more complicated, the, the manufacturers, the, the big name manufacturers are starting to go as the technology gets smaller, it's getting harder to differentiate e-bikes from regular bicycles. All the bikes shown here are e-bikes. So it would actually be difficult to, uh, to classify them, uh, to identify, and to, to be able to enforce, you know, what, uh, 
which ones, which of the bikes will be allowed to be on the trails, correct? Yes, I would agree with you. You have a few questions. Do we have other clarifying Sorry. questions? We, we do want to hear from the public, so if it's not a clarifying question, let's wait. Okay, yes, please. Are there speedometers on the e-bikes? That's a great question, thank you. Yes, uh, a lot of the e-bikes that are coming out have speedometers on them. Um, and then a lot of cyclists, I'm a cyclist, um, a lot of, of acoustic bicycles also have the ability to, to see your speed. I have a, a little computer on my bike that tells me how fast I'm going, and it's a regular bike. Well, just to clarify, some do, some don't. We don't know how many do or don't. There's no requirement, correct, by the manufact for manufacturers? Yeah, there's no requirement. But just the way the bikes are designed, a lot of manufacturers put on some kind of a, a little screen to tell you how much battery you have left, what your speed would be, the, the settings of the motor. And one more thing to add on to that is the, the bikes do have an internal speedometer. That's how they know when to turn off that motor. It's just a matter of being able to see that speed displayed. Other questions from council? Okay, let's Mayor, go to Mayor, may, I, may I just add a, clarify, a clarifying piece to this? Please. Uh, so uh, I just want to be clear, we did and have gone to the Parks and Rec Commission for conversations about this issue. Um, we have engaged with the Parks and Rec Commission on a number of occasions talking about the trails, um, but e-bikes as well. Um, our intention was to get your direction for this and return to Parks and Rec for um, final sort of blessing of where we are um, with this ultimately. But Parks and Rec Commission has fed um, and provided input, valuable input to this process. Um, the share of the road um, comment have been echoed by the Parks and Rec Commission since the very beginning, along with um, concerns and issues about speed. So. Um, what staff has presented tonight is, is consistent with between the BPAC and what Parks and Rec Commission has given um, in terms of comments to staff. Thank you. Okay. We will now go to public to hear what the public has to say. And our first speaker is Mariah Gregoriev. Thank you. My name's Mariah Grigoriev, and I'm here to <clears throat> ask the council to reject the staff recommendation that allows e-bikes and e-devices on the coastal trail. After hearing the remarks, I've, I've wanted to part from my prepared remarks because I feel that we're not on the right target. We're talking about do we have a 12 mile an hour speed limit or a 28 mile an hour speed limit? when in actuality, the biggest danger thing is the danger of trying to put bikes, skateboards, scooters, children, dogs, older people, disabled people in a limited space and expect everybody to get along. And the only thing we have for safety is signage. It's silly. It's a silly conversation. I, the last time I was on the coastal trail with my friend here, you know, I walk, I take my dogs when I'm not on the coastal trail, but when I get tired, I have a seat, I can sit down. But you know what happens when I sit down, even though I'm on the edge, I'm an obstacle that everybody else has to get around. And the more bikes there are, and the more people there are, you know, people walk in groups, they go with their friends, and they occupy space. And when people are trying to pass each other, and also bikes are trying to pass people in two directions, you have skateboards and scooters. It's a zoo, and it's a dangerous zoo. And I can tell you what it feels like when you're walking, and all of a sudden you hear the screech behind you. You hear the cleats hit the ground, and then they take their bikes and go. 
huff and puff past you. You know, what are you doing here? Now, according to this policy, what I could do is get an e-bike, and when I get tired, I flick a switch and go zooming at 15 miles an hour down the trail. Is that a better idea? No, I don't think so. I think what we need to understand in this policy is that we are stewards of this trail. We are stewards of the coastside. And decisions we make will have an impact for a lifetime for us and for our kids. Do we want our kids to think that this nature experience is to be learned on scooters and bikes and skateboards? No. Small children ought to be able to dart around. You know, a three-year-old is like trying to control a cat. You know, they're not safe on that trail with bikes there. They really aren't safe because they will not walk in a straight line and hug the edge. They will say something over here and go jump there. You know, dog walkers, they're not going to be falling off because, well, at any rate, I, I urge you to reject this whole idea. It is a treasure, a national treasure. People will look at us and think we are crazy, that we are giving up a wonderful walk that is accessible to everybody. It is level, it is paved. The youngest to the oldest can use it. And we're all going to be crowded out because we think that it's important because e-bikes are now cheaper, they're better batteries, they go faster, they're smaller, they're lighter, people like them. But why give up our jewel in the crown? Because there are other bikes that other people open up their trails. That's okay. Why not open up ours? It's crazy. This is a very special thing, and it's up to you and us to protect it and to keep it there for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Next, we have Joyce Logan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be here. Um, Jessica, were you able to share this with everybody? Um, this is the Carmel Pine Cone, and it's a picture of a woman who tripped on the, the sidewalk. It's a known hazard. She face planted. I don't want to be that woman on the coastal trail uh, because an e-bike or an ele any electric device has gone past me fast, has scared my dog, and the dog has pulled me over. I don't want to be that person, so that's why I wanted to share that with you, um, because I'm worried a little bit about the liability to the city of creating a known hazard. Um, something that I was um, taken by, the survey that you get, um, that said a number of respondents have been using electric devices on our trails already. Despite the fact that they're banned, that concerns me. They're banned and yet people feel free to use those devices. Um, how are we going to control who uses them, what speed they go? Who's going to be there to monitor that? How are we going to know that they went six miles an hour behind, by somebody? So I see enforcement problems that are gonna create conflict. That's of concern. Um, I am only speaking about the coastal trail because I am not familiar with the Naomi Patridge Trail nor the East Side Trail. I'm, I walk the coastal trail. It's narrow. Um, I'm, oh, my dog's getting away. bike just went past me. I didn't hear that bike come up behind me. That's a startle reaction that's very normal. Being over, picking up dog poop is a very vulnerable position. You want us to pick up the dog poop. So think about the positions, what Mariah talked about being on her situation, our situation with dogs. Um, I'd like to point out that I looked up how much the e-bikes weigh, 35 to 80 pounds. 
with an average of 50 pounds. That's a lot of mass. Bicycles, human-powered bicycles, weigh 17 to 20 pounds. Twice as much plus. That's a lot hitting me if they hit me. So I just want to share that. Um, are the drivers licensed? Are they trained? Do they have to have insurance to ride these devices? Is that my three minutes? I have two more pages. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Come Thank on. you, Joyce. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Michael Ferreira. Good evening, Mayor Penrose and Council members. <clears throat> I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Loma Prieta chapter of the Sierra Club. In May of last year, the National Board of Directors uh, produced a new resolution regarding what are commonly referred to as e-bikes, which is a brilliant marketing move by their manufacturers. But to us, they are powered vehicles, period. For something like 30 years, the Sierra Club has worked with bicycle organizations to try to straighten out conflicts between human powered bicycles and pedestrians and hikers. We are after all the Birkenstockers. The, and we have a tentative standoff as to where it is appropriate or and not to have human powered bicycles, i.e. mountain bikes. But this new phenomenon of what we consider to be motorcycles, electric motorcycles, parading themselves as bikes, creates hazard to pedestrians and really hazard to the users. And yes, they're increasing in popularity. And yes, there's going to be a lot of them coming. And that's all the more reason that I think the council needs to be vigilant. I will say that among the many interesting things that happen today across the world, like winning in Wisconsin and winning in Chicago and winning in New York, there was also Paris, France, that voted 89% to 11% to ban electric scooters. And the reason they did it was because there's 15,000 of the things in Paris and they wore out their welcome. We don't need to do that to our coastal trail. I did see something in one of the staff reports about stakeholders. The Sierra Club was not one of the stakeholders apparently, nor was Green Foothills, nor was the venerable Coast Walk. Uh, an organization that has supported the Coastal Trail for what, three decades or so. The, at least two of us have given their opinions tonight. I have talked to Coast Walk. They're, they're very sad about these developments. Uh, and I know people that go out on the Coastal Trail and when these things go flying past them, they say, slow down. And what they get is the F word and a raised single figure, OK? We talk about enforcement. We can't enforce speed limits because we don't have people who stand there with radar guns. The better enforcement is just say no. And please don't listen to anything about senior citizens needing the pedal assist. If you're a senior citizen somewhere in my area, you shouldn't be on any kind of bicycle, frankly, because we don't bounce real well. The, uh, I, I do implore the council to take a good close look at this recommendation and act in the best interest of coastal trail users. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Mike. Our next speaker is Crystalyn. Thank you, Crystalyn from the Coastside Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to work this through. Um, it's the chamber's position that we uh, fully endorse a speed limit, but we do not endorse taking e-bikes off the trail. Um, e-bikes have been on the trail for upwards of seven plus years and accidents are few and far between and quite honestly are more caused by jerks than the bikes themselves. And um, to outlaw or out ordinance a entire genre of something just because there's butt heads who are misusing the equipment is unfair. And as was mentioned by staff, this probably won't fly too easily past Coastal Commission anyway. Um, doesn't seem like a fight worth getting into with them. And for many of our workers, as it was mentioned, the Coastal Trail is one of their main um, arteries back and forth on the coast side. Uh, we have lots of essential workers that need to bike to work. And quite honestly, after eight to 10 hours in a field or working at Safeway on your feet all day, having a little pedal assist on your way home is a real freaking nice thing if you can afford it. Um, and uh, so to take that away from them, because again, there's a few people who are bad actors, is just really not fair. And then we've been really keen on working on economic development and electrifying the city. And we've got multiple businesses that have popped up, um, either changing their um, platform or coming into the area uh, and working on building a business out of e-bikes. And it's not really fair to ask everybody else to electrify everywhere else and then limit the one thing um, where electrification is actually working really well and uh, is helping people sustain a livelihood. Um, so the Chamber of Commerce asks you to accept staff's recommendation. Speed limits are good. Banning, not so good. Thank you. Thank you, Kristalyn. Uh, we do have one more speaker, Carolina Carbajal. Buenas noches otra vez. Good, good evening once again. Quiero decirles que apoyo completamente a lo que ellos dicen. So I just want to let you know that I support exactly what they're saying. Si en este pueblo hay muchas veces que se ha querido avanzar en la tecnología, en vivienda, y la han rechazado, ¿por qué ahora quieren implementar bicicletas? Why is it that, because in this town, uh, you may want technology to advance in accordance to like housing, why then would you not want to uh, reject this? Bicicletas, cuando nosotros sabemos que la gente visita nuestro pueblo por alejarse de la ciudad. The bikes, that is, because we know that people actually come to visit our town because they want to get away from the city. Quisiera comentarles que hay un estudio que dice que relativamente el ser humano, después de cierto tiempo, vuelve a retomar lo antiguo. ¿Viene a retomar qué? Lo antiguo. There's a research that's being done that says, basically says that human beings after a while kind of want to go back to what they used to have a long time ago. Un ejemplo es que, digamos, en los noventas, las personas usaban los pantalones flojos de abajo. En la actualidad, ya lo volvieron a usar. An example, back in the 90s, uh, people used to use pants that were kind of loose, uh, fitting, and guess what? They're back. Las personas actualmente quieren usar bicicletas eléctricas. Dentro de 30 años van a querer caminar. People today want to use e-bikes. 30 years from now, they will not want to use e-bikes. Simplemente eso se llama la humanidad le gusta retomar lo antiguo. That's just human nature, that's humanity. They kind of want to recycle back into those things. Sé que es importante avanzar al paso de la tecnología. I know it's important to be on the cutting edge of technology. Dejemos esto para la ciudad. La ciudad lo puede tener y ahí la gente puede ir a divertirse en eso. 
let's leave this up to the city. Uh, you guys can have this and people can go have fun. Ahí cuentan con todas las sistemas accesibles. And they can count on with all the systems that are accessible to them. Si no quieren estar en la ciudad, que vengan a nuestro pueblo a disfrutar de sus playas. If they don't want to be in the city, they can come visit our town, see, uh, be here on the beaches. Que vengan y caminen, disfruten de nuestros uh, lugares hermosos. Come, walk around, look at all the beautiful sights. No necesitamos tener esa tecnología en las playas para poder disfrutar de eso. We don't need that technology on our beaches to have fun. Creo que deberíamos de force, eh, promover nuestra energía en cosas más importantes para nuestro pueblo. I think we should be spending our energies or promote our energies on more important things in our town. Y por favor, ellos fueron los que contribuyeron a que nuestro país avanzara. Hay que cuidar y defenderlos a ellos también, sus necesidades. So let's really realize that they're the ones who contributed to everything in our country now. So let's give back to them. Así que todo por equidad es bueno. Muchas gracias. Everything with equity is good. Thank you very much. No other speakers, Mayor. Okay, we'll bring it back to Council for Discussion. Who would like to start? I'll Council start, Member Rabak. I'll start. Um, when I first uh, started looking into this uh, ordinance, I was ambivalent. The more I think about it, the more it's clear to me that the thing that tr trumps all other issues is safety. That um, having these e-bikes on the coastal trail, and let me be clear, I'm talking only about the coastal trail, I'm not talking about the Highway 1 trails, which I think can accommodate uh, e-bikes safely. Um, it's it just clear to me that sooner or later, somebody is going to get killed uh, with a collision between a, a, an e-bike and a pedestrian, or even two e-bikes. Um, I understand the, the reasons that people want to commute on the coastal trail, um, and I even understand that some seniors might find it uh, helpful. But the safety issue to me, where you have these uh, e-bikes that you really can't control uh, the speed limits, uh, that we shouldn't have them on the coastal trail. So I, I will not support having uh, any form of e-bikes or e-scooters or any, any other uh, electrified um, means of transportation on the coastal trail. Okay, I emphasize coastal trail. It's, uh, it seems to me it makes sense to have e-bikes and other uh, electronic uh, uh, means of transportation on the Highway 1 trails, on uh, Naomi Patridge Trail on the East Side Trail, um, that's okay, but having them on the coastal trail makes no sense to me uh, from a safety perspective. That's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Jimenez. Thank you. How to enforce uh, electric bikes, e-bikes on the trail is very difficult. It would be difficult to actually tell what class they are, one, two, or three. As we have talked in the past, we are in a, a senior-friendly community. You know, if you ride your bicycle from uh, Kelly Avenue on the coastal trail, just a regular bicycle, to the harbor, it takes an average of about 25 minutes. There's really not much you can enjoy if you went 25 minutes uh, on, the, on the stretch. I think uh, the coastal trail is more for walking. To be, if you want to enjoy nature, you know that will be the best way to do it. If you want to commute, we have the uh, East Side Trail, Highway One. If the e-bikes can actually go 20, 20 miles per hour, I think they'd be better, they'd be better off on the highway. You know, uh, and of course, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to enforce the speed limit. If we're not able to tell what uh, class they are, enforcing a spill, it may be very difficult. 
you know, I am an avid walker. You know, I do walk the coast trail, and I see bicycles on the trail. I see families. I see uh, or seniors you know, on the coastal trail. It need be a uh, it be difficult, you know, for them to actually to be able to avoid a collision with uh, a knee bike that is going 50 miles per hour. And now when you you know when you walk on the coastal trail, you don't see the bicycles, you know, e bikes slowing down. You know, they're supposed to slow down to five miles per hour. It is difficult. So um, I'm uh, in favor of uh, having the e bikes out on the on the highway one in the Eastside Trail, not on the coastal trail. Let's enjoy the coastal trail. You know, let's walk it. All right, let's. Uh, Make sure that our children, little kids, uh, dog walkers, or uh, seniors enjoy uh, the coastal trail. So I'm not in favor of uh, this ordinance. Thank you. Other council members? Yes, council member Ruddock. I concur with um, council members Warbach and uh, Jimenez. We can't hear you. I concur with um, Harvey and Joaquin on this issue. Uh, another thing that hasn't been raised, though, is the, um, the state, the condition of the coastal trail. Um, it's in really bad shape. And it's, it's unsafe, you know, for regular bikes and, uh, in some places, walkers. So, you know, until, um, you know, the condition were improved, I wouldn't even, you know, entertain it. But I think it's a bad idea anyway. I think slow is beautiful on the coastal trail. And um, uh, see, see no reason to um, exacerbate what... I see is a lot of butthead behavior now. I don't see how we're going to um, get a handle on that. So uh, I would support um, the position of my compadres here. Thank you. Council Member Brownstone. Well, I'm really delighted to see that there's some consensus on our council on this. Um, I thought I might be the only one who wasn't <laughs> delighted. Thrilled with the idea of e-bikes. Um, you know, I'm always curious. I wonder why the state in 2016 started approving e-bikes. I'm sure there was some maybe interesting lobbying going on by mm -hmm. certain businesses. Um, interesting that state parks initially allowed for Class 2 and Class 1 and then all of a sudden decided not to allow for Class 2. Be interested in some of their thinking. But anyway, regarding our situation... It is a narrow trail. I live two blocks from that trail. And it is narrow. On a nice warm day, especially on weekends, there's lots of families. Everybody naturally starts crossing the trail a bit. A lot of people don't really warn anyone that they're coming from behind them until the last second. They say, on your left. I wish we could just give bells to all the regular bikes, you know, those little ringing bells to help people know. But you got a bike going at 20 miles an hour, that chance to react from someone coming up from behind gets narrower and narrower. So to me, it just seems it's physics. It's a recipe for disaster. You have this narrow space. You have bikes which weigh between 30 and 35 pounds going up to 28 miles per hour. I mean, just physics to me means disasters and high liability for the city. And I agree uh, with my fellow council members. We have the east side of the trail, which more and more is, will be completed. And um, yeah, I think it's fine if we simply ban e-bikes on the trail and there's enough folks who enjoy walking and riding regular bicycles, and we won't be depriving masses of people of um, recreational um, enjoyment of the trail. So I think it's very hard to enforce. In fact, the law, as you stated before, was, or as you claim, said, was you're supposed to slow down to five miles per hour when passing. Who thinks that's going to happen? Seriously, that people slow down every time, every time they pass someone on a weekend, that's only five miles per hour the entire time. There's so many people on the trail. 
So it just seems very unrealistic, and um, I will vote against this with my fellow council members. Well, I can't tell you how happy and proud I am of our council. I think this is the right decision to make. We do not need e-bikes on our coastal trail. It is a treasure. It's a treasure that I, I love, that we, we are, it, it's being destroyed as we speak, as Councilmember Ruddock said. Weather and just pedestrian traffic is taking its toll. Um, we need the coastal trail for our sanity. We need it for our mental health, we need it for our physical health, and we do not need e-bikes for either of those things. Um, they're great for commuting, and I, I love seeing them on the east side. Parallel Trail, Naomi Patrick Trail, and on the highway, but I am in concordance with all of my fellow council members. No e-bikes on the coastal trail. Okay. Mayor, Can, Mayor could, yes. Could I ask the, for clarification from the council just in terms of um, what, I, what we're hearing? Uh, clearly, we understand the desire to just um, outright ban um, all e-bikes on the, on the coastal trail. That's pretty clear. Um, staff's presentation also discussed the other electric vehicles being the board's scooters, all of those things, and I, 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 we would ask for clarity on where the council is landing on, on those um, as well with this so we know um, how to prepare um, an ordinance coming back to you. Okay, can I ask each council member to mention, excuse me. If I may, if I may to add on to that, to, if we're going by coastal trail and then the other trails for, for the e-bikes and e or boards and scooters, Coastal Trail also and East Side and Emmy Patrick as two separate things. We can't hear. Sorry, I, I was asking for for some additional clarification. Um, if we're discussing separating this uh, Coastal Trail as a separate thing from the East Side and Emmy Patrick, now that we're talking about scooters and boards, um, also looking at those as Coastal Trail is separate from East Side and Emmy Patrick for. Uh, the getting staffs or getting the recommendation for staff. Okay, council members, council member Brownstone, how do you feel about e-bikes, any kind of electric vehicle on the coastal trail? I think it's easier to ban all of them. Thank you, council member Ruddock. I'm against scooters and boards on the coastal trail. Thank you. No electric power uh, vehicles on the on the trail. Councilmember Rarbach. I concur. I concur as well. Does that clarify things? Thank you. Do we need to make a decision about um, speed limits on the east side parallel trail and the Naomi? Do we have to address that issue? If I, <clears throat> if I may, um, I think uh, Maz Bozerginia, Public Works Director, I think it would be great to just hear from the council about your direction on speed limits on, on the, different, um, ele the different trail segments that we've been talking about. Again, just for clar clarity to the staff <clears throat> so that we can come back with a well thought out and um, put together ordinance. If, if, if I could also um, remind the council that there are certain electric um, vehicles that are permitted regardless of what we do segways being one had a, a very special uh, um, lobby activity many years ago but also uh, the electric scooters or uh, wheelchairs things of that nature for ada and excessive um, access and everything so we, we just want to say those are clearly something that we'll have to exclude out from there and we didn't hear you saying you wanted to outlaw those um, but that was um, for clarity's sake, uh, I think staff heard that you did not, as a council, believe that uh, placing a speed limit on the coastal trail, regardless of whether there's electrified or non-electrified bikes, was going to have a great um, bearing on this, and that you did not want staff to proceed with coming back with um, a speed limit on the coastal trail. 
that's a question. I, d I don't think we really discussed that. Okay. And then the second piece of that would follow along with what um, Moz was saying, which is for clarity on whether we should look at, um, again, speed limit, and again, clarify that we're, uh, we would, that you are in support or not of, of all electric and what types of electric vehicles on the, the Highway 1 trails, we'll just call them the, coast, uh, the parallel trail and the Naomi Patridge trail. I think I think we know where you're where you're where you were leaning, but it'd be just good to have that uh, um, clear for us as we come back with something to you. Okay. Uh, Council, why don't we uh, chime in on how we feel about speed limits for non-electrified vehicles, i.e., bikes, um, on the coastal trail? Do we want signage? Do we want a speed limit? What do we want to do? I don't think it would be really enforceable, you know. I, I, I'm in favor of uh, a speed limit of 15 miles per hour for electric wheelchairs. <laughs> but, um, no, I, certainly the coastal trail has to be ADA, you know, accessible. So, um, but I, I, I don't see the point with non-motorized uh, um, On the other hand, I don't think it hurts to have signage that says... 15 mile an hour speed limit. Um, it might help some people to slow down. I don't know. Well, except, you know, I, I know I'm, you can't enforce it. You're right. I, I don't want to have, I don't want to load up the coastal trail with a lot of signage, right? You're supposed to be able to go there and enjoy it. And you don't want a lot of signs saying, don't do this, don't do that. You know, I think by, um, yeah, I think by just um, limiting it to non motorized vehicles, I think that'll solve a lot of the problem. But I do think 15 miles per hour on the east side of Naomi Patridge Trail makes sense. Um, and, and signage there is a little bit less of an issue, I think. So. Okay. Council Member Brownstone. Yeah, I agree. And most non-electric bikes do not have speedometers, so it'll be very hard to self-regulate. And we're not going to, someone mentioned earlier, we're not going to have people with um, radar guns. So yeah. I don't think speed limit for the uh, west side of the coastal trail would be necessary. And on the east side trail and Naomi Patridge in the highway, do you, what do you think about signage or speed limits for the electric vehicles there? Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly what that speed limit should be based on the width of the trails there and how much traffic they're going to get. I mean, we could start with 15 miles per hour and see how that works. Naomi Patridge is narrow. That's a narrow trail. That's not very wide. So I think a speed yeah. limit there for sure. And I, I, it looks to me like the trail on the um, east side, at least the one the county's doing, it's, it's somewhat wider, but not super wide. But it's easier to enforce there because you have sheriff's vehicles going up and down the highway. Um, I just think 15 miles per hour is easier to enforce there. Um, and the electric vehicles will also have speedometers as Robert pointed out, so. And to Harvey's issue before, you know, it's mostly about safety, and, you know, if you're over 18, you don't even have to wear a helmet, right, legally, on an electric bike. Yep. So, you know, the opportunity for a lot of serious injuries, and you're going at a higher speed, and there's cracks or whatever, um, is greatly increased, so I think, um, yeah. So I think keeping the speed limit to 15 makes sense on the east side for now. Councilmember Barbach. Um, are we going to allow class three e-bikes on the Highway 1 trails? I'd rather start small, start with class one, see how that works out. Okay. I, I'd be okay with, um, with one and two. It, it, you know, those are more like commuter trails and, you know, if we're going to be seeking, you know, grants, in, the, in fact, we're now seeking grants for segments of the East Side Trail, uh, and we're probably framing it as, you know, commuter trails, I'm guessing, um, for, you know, nursery workers and, and, mm -hmm. and others and, you know, school children going to the schools. So I would actually support one, two, and three on the East Side and Naomi Patridge Trail. Yeah, I'd be all right with that. 
I would too. Vice Mayor Hennis. Thank you. Um, for the East Side Trail and the Naomi Patrick Trail, I do agree uh, with uh, having class one, two, and three. That's uh, been a commuter uh, trails between uh, our cities on the coast. Uh, but the signage, uh, the speed limit, you know, keeping speed limit to uh, 15 miles per hour, yes, for safety. I know they can reach you know, a speed limit of uh, 28, and that's uh, pretty fast. Uh, hopefully, we don't have any uh, teenagers riding that fast on, uh, on those e-bikes. Uh, on that, but the trail, uh, the coastal trail, uh, the signage, uh, maybe yes, uh, the uh, starting of the trail, at the, uh, and the parking is about slow down for pedestrians, you know, regular bicycles. Okay, well, I I would prefer to see just class one and two bikes on the east side parallel trail, but I will go along with what. The council decides, um, and if the majority want all three, three, I'm okay with that. Sorry, I would just go with one and two for now to start. Actually, okay. Yeah. Anybody else for one and two? There's a one, two, and three. There's a one and two. There's a one and two. One, two, and three. One, two, and three, and. All right, the one, two, and threes win. <laughs> Is that enough clarification? Maz, you okay? Um, I, I, I'm assuming on the, the Highway 1 trails, other E devices are all right. Scoot away. Yeah. Thank you so much for your input. Really helpful, and, and the community as well. This is really helpful for us as we come back to this item. Great. I guess that's it on item 3B. We will move on to item 3C, mid-year review and adoption of resolution to amend the fiscal year 2022-23 budget. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Kenneth Stiles, and I'm the finance manager for the city. Ken, Kenneth, could you speak really close to the... Oh. How's this? Thank you. That's okay. much better. <laughs> Tonight, I will be presenting the mid-year review for the fiscal 2022 to 2023 budget. Our fiscal year starts July 1st and ends June 30th, 2023. We have a short agenda tonight. We will be discussing uh, major revenues and revenue adjustments, uh, the expenditure side, uh, capital improvement plan, and of course the financial outlook. On this slide, we have th our three major revenues, uh, transient occupancy tax, TOT, property taxes, and sales and use taxes. Um, this table highlights what we adopted back in July, our actuals at the mid-year airport, which is in December. Excuse me for one second, Kenneth. I'm sorry to interrupt. Jessica, can we get rid of the participant little thing that's hiding all the numbers? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So on this table, we have, uh, for a TOT, we received 3.9 million, which is about 45% of our budget. Uh, this time last year, we had received 35%. So that signals to us that we're overperforming at least what we budgeted for. We tend to budget conservatively and come back six months later to adjust. Um, after reviewing, staff is recommending an adjustment of 800,000 roughly to bring it up to 9.6 million. That 9.6, um, what's the assumptions that went into that number is a dip in January, February, March months because of the storms. 
Uh, we don't have the final numbers yet, but we're anticipating um, lower occupancy levels for those reasons. And then for the rest of the year, from April to June, we're anticipating the same performance as last year. We think 9.6 is fairly conservative. It may be a little bit more, but we think that's in line to what we can expect. Property taxes, we've received about 1.9 million, about 56%. We think we're gonna end the year at 3.8, which is about $400,000 more. And then finally, sales and use taxes. Uh, we've received about 37% uh, of our budget. Compared to last year, this time it was 32. Um, the city does have a sales tax consultant that is more in tune with our sales taxes and how we compare to other municipalities. They help us come to the number of, they estimated out 3.3 million for us, which is about a $300,000 increase. Major revenues, uh, adjustments total 1.6. Roughly half of that is TOT. We do have a lot of other uh, revenue adjustments that are in the attachments as with the staff report. Um, those total up to 138. One, one, the two uh, things that I'm gonna highlight for council tonight is franchise tax. Um, I think we're gonna get 188 more there. And then we have a bit of an outlier and with our poplar beach parking fees. Unfortunately, one of the machine there went down for several months and um, we were unable to collect revenues at, the, at that location. Since then, it's been repaired and uh, staff is working towards creating, uh, adding another machine to create redundancy. From there, we have a total revenue adjustment of 1.7 million. On the operating expenditure side, uh, staff really went into this conservatively. Um, we only have adjustments for council's approval, totaling 144,000. That's split pretty evenly between two departments. City attorney, uh, this is for legal, additional legal support for uh, special projects, uh, Smithfield and the housing element. And then, the other half of that is roughly for facilities and maintenance. Uh, we had a unexpected large electricity bill come in that the amount requested for this department is just to cover that one charge. We do have capital improvement project adjustments, but we're not recommending using general fund monies to fund those adjustments. We think it's uh, more appropriate to just use unassigned capital funds. For capital improvement projects, we have two new CIP projects, an emergency outfall repair, uh, repairing the outfall and pipe segments um, relating from the storms and the recent weather we've been having, that's about 150. And then finally, the safety element, which is about 80K. Uh, the safety element is a requirement of the general plan element, and it's a use to address emergency preparation response and mitigation uh, citywide. We have adjustments to existing projects. Uh, the one of note is the corporation yard. Um, we have, we're going into contingency spending, which was previously approved by council last summer. And a portion of that is for uh, security cameras at the location. Overall, total CIP adjustments total 478,000, again, using unused capital funds. So here's what the general fund will look like if council were to approve uh, the adjustments as mentioned. As compared to the budget we adopted, we have revenues going from 21 million to 23 million and expenditures staying relatively close, uh, an increase of around 100,000. Now, all the extra revenue that we're anticipating, what happens is that revenue is gonna show up in our unassigned fund balance, which is towards the bottom of that table, and bump up our reserves a little bit. Reserves would be 9.8, which would be 50% per policy, and our unassigned funds would be 5.1. 
uh, instead of 3.6 that we were anticipating when we adopted the budget. Now, the 5.1 is a nice number to have, but I do stress to council that staff is not recommending assignment of those funds uh, tonight, namely for two reasons. Um, one is best practice to reserve assignments um, during the formal budget process so you can see everything at the same time. But also, more importantly, staff is anticipating using a portion of those funds to balance out next fiscal year. And I have more information on that on the following slide. Now, this is our financial outlook. Uh, we, you see the re, uh, revised budget and then two years uh, going looking forward, next budget year and the budget year after that. Um, the biggest challenge for the city going into next, uh, this upcoming budget year is ARPA funds are expiring. ARPA funds were COVID funds that were allocated to the city. The city uh, received 1.5 million uh, annually for two years. We will not be receiving that next year. So there is a bit of a gap there when we go into the next budget. As of right now, with a very simple forecast, that gap can be filled or mitigated with unassigned uh, fund balances. You can see on the bottom of the table, uh, assuming uh, we don't add anything or take anything from our current budget, our unassigned will go down to about 2.8. And then the year after that, 1.3. Now this is a forecast, it's, it's very preliminary. It, the only thing, it, it assumes that uh, it removes one-time revenues, it adds a CPI and inflation multiplier to our existing expenditures, and, but it doesn't add anything programmatic or take away anything programmatic. It's essentially asking, answering the question, if we copy and paste our budget next year, how do we look? And we look okay. Um, the biggest thing that can change this going forward is uh, public safety or sheriff contracts, uh, pension, and capital project funding, meaning if council decides to add a little bit more, or maybe take away um, in either direction, uh, this forecast can and won't change as we get closer to budget adoption. With that, the recommendation is as follows for tonight. Adopt the attached resolution to amend the fiscal year 2022-2023 operating and capital budget. With that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Kenneth. Are there any clarifying questions from council? Okay, do we have any public comment? I have no public speakers, Mayor. Okay, I'll bring it back to council for discussion. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for uh, that thorough report. And yeah, those are the things I really think we need to be thinking about. We will have sheriff's contract pensions, capital improvement projects coming up. And I remember you gave a longer term um, view at the last full budget committee and say, you know, at a certain rate, we'd be operating at a deficit in four or five years. So um, I think this year it's just important when we consider what we're going to spend money on and what we're not to really think about the fact that the ARPA funds are running out and we have these other um, outstanding bills that are growing. So depending on that pace of um, revenue, we really have to keep our eye on the budget when we're thinking about. And remember, during COVID, we, re we had to put off a lot of those um, capital improvement projects, right? Because we had a $5 million reduction in our um, TOT tax. ARPA kind of helped with, with that, even that out a bit. But that's the reality. So. Um, we always have, and, and we do keep good reserves, but we also have to be ready for other contingencies that might unexpectedly reduce our TOT. So I just think um, it's good to keep on the radar screen. 
And thank you for helping us keep those all on our radar screen. Appreciate that. Does anyone else on council have anything to say? I just want to say that I always enjoy Ken's reports. <laughs> he's always very thorough. He communicates well. And, uh, you know, he's conservative in his uh, uh, projections. So thank you for that. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it too, Kenneth. And we will ask now for a motion. I move that we adopt the attached resolution to amend the FY 2022 through 23 operating and capital budget. Second. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Member Brownstone? Yes. Council Member Rarbeck? Yes. Council Member Reddick? Yes. Vice Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Mayor Penrose? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. We will now move on to commission and committee updates. Anything? Okay, nothing for future discussion, possible agenda items. I did get an email from commute.org. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that um, there is a, in terms of commuting, down the new lanes, you know, and, hi and on Highway 101. Express lanes. Express lanes, thank you. There is a, a very interesting equity program for commuters, and they could not only, not only can they come and present to the council, but then they can then go on over to some of our nonprofits um, that uh, serve a number of folks in our communities who use Highway 101 in order to commute, and show them how to apply uh, for these pretty significant discounts um, on the express lane so people can get to work on time. So yeah, if we could maybe agendize that and I'll get back to, or, or I'll connect staff with commute.org as to what a good time would be, so thanks. We need one other council I'm good with that. Okay, we've got two for the New item, possible agenda item. Do we have any city council reports? Well, then I will adjourn this meeting and thank you all.